picture was supposed to be a video of our June campers welcoming you to our online worship service. However, I pushed the camera button instead of the video button. So, let me welcome you to our online worship service and ask you to be praying for our June camp kids this last week of June camp. And please join us next week for June camp Sunday. God be with you as you sing and pray and read God's word with us today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. I'm writing to God's church in Corinth and Oak Ridge, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. This is holy ground, we're standing on holy ground, for the Lord is present, and where He is, is holy. This is holy
I have been thinking a lot about this book that I picked up a couple of years ago and started reading and never finished. I don't know if any of y'all have that problem like me, but what I did read um, was very impactful and I've been thinking about it a lot lately. Uh, the book is called Help Thanks Wow, The Three Essential Prayers by Anne Lamott. And she basically breaks down those three words being the essential prayers, help, thanks, and wow. Um, and in the introduction, she kind of explains how we learn to pray, which is something I never thought about. Um, and I found that in my spiritual walk, sometimes the most simple things have become complex as I grow older. Some things I've never thought about are really interesting if you really think about it. So. In the introduction, she says, Some of you were taught to pray at bedtime with your parents, and when I spent the night at your houses, I heard all of you saying these terrifying words. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake. Wait, what? What did you say? I could die in my sleep? I'm only seven years old. I pray the Lord my soul to take. That so, so did not work for me, especially in the dark in a strange home. Don't be taking my soul. You leave my soul right here in my 50-pound body. Help. Sometimes the first time we pray, we cry out in the deepest desperation, God help me. This is a great prayer as we are then at our absolutely most degraded and isolated, which means we are nice and juicy with the consequences of our best thinking and are thus possibly teachable. Or I might be in one of my dangerously good moods and say casually, hey, hi person, me again, the princess. Thank you for my sobriety, my grandson, my flowering pear tree. Or you might shout at the top of your lungs or whisper into your sleeve, I hate you, God. That is a prayer too, because it is real, it is truth, and maybe it is the first sincere thought you've had in months. Some of us have cavernous vibrations inside us when we communicate with God. Others are more rational and less messy in our spiritual sense of reality, in our petitions and gratitude and expressions of pain or anger or desolation or praise. Prayer means that in some unique way, we believe we're invited into a relationship with someone who hears us when we speak in silence. Um, and I just love the simplicity of it. We've, I have complicated prayer sometimes. Um, if I think I don't have enough pretty words to say, I just won't say anything at all. Um, when really, just get down to basics. You can just cry silently in your soul, help, or thanks or wow when you're in awe and you don't even have to elaborate and God can fill in the blanks and get to work on whatever it is you're asking for or praising him for. He knows what we need. He knows what we mean. Um, even when we can't say anything at all. And that's just the amazing graciousness of our God. Um, and the, the amazing gift of his spirit dwelling within us that we can communicate constantly, silently, or with all of the beautiful words we can think of. Um, so wherever you are in your prayer walk, um, as with every season, we have highs and lows. Maybe you're praying all the time regularly and filled with words to speak to God. That is wonderful, keep going. Um, or maybe you're in a place where you don't know what to say or you don't have anything to say and don't wanna say anything to God. That's okay, keep saying the few words that come to mind, whatever truth you need to speak to God. He hears you, even when you can't form the actual words. Um, so let me say a quick prayer as we take our communion this morning. God, thank you for being so gracious as to give us your spirit so that we can speak without saying anything, um, that you can work without us even knowing what we need. Thank you for being so kind and loving and giving us each other um, when we can't pray, we can't find the words, we can pray for others on their behalf. Um, it's such a blessing to be able to do that for one another. Thank you for sending your son to die for our sins. We love you so much and in your name I pray, amen.
Now we come to family prayer time, a time where the family prays for each other. If you have somebody that you know that needs your prayers, let them know that you're praying for them by texting them your prayer. Or if you need a prayer, let someone know, either one of the shepherds or someone you know will pray for you. Welcome back, Oak Ridge family and friends, for another online worship service. I need to let everybody know we have June Camp Sunday next week. That's where all of the June Campers come and lead us in the songs and the prayers and the scripture readings and lead us through a special worship service. So there will be no online worship service next week. That's going to be done by the, the June Campers as they put the finishing touches on that for us this week in preparation. Okay, what's with the black shirt and the white bow tie, Ron? Well, this is probably the closest you'll ever get to seeing me in a clerical collar. You know, I'm just probably not cut from the right cloth to be a man of the cloth. That's a really bad pun. In fact, I probably look more like a blackjack dealer than I do a priest. But look, here's the deal. What do you consider holy? And what makes for a saint, especially biblically. This word for holiness or sacred or saint, both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, it, they come from the same root, the same idea, the same concept. So what I'd like to do for us today is address this idea of being called to be a saint, to be saints as the body of Christ. Now, you may have some idea of what a saint looks like. Maybe it looks something like that. And, and you may be thinking in terms of sp some kind of spiritual superhumans that somehow uh, rise above the level of us normal everyday folks. We, we use language like, I'm no saint or he's no saint. And we use language like, holier than thou and actually think of that as kind of a derogatory term. Or maybe, maybe you think about the, the image itself, that saints are represented by icons or statues and paraded around towns. Maybe you think in terms of holy water or holy icons or holy objects in church buildings. Maybe you think of the cross as a holy symbol, or even the fish that uh, people used to stick on the bumpers of their cars. What does it mean to be holy, to be a saint? This is the biblical idea I want to explore today, because I do believe we are called to be saints. But I want to let go of the idea of spiritual superhumans or magical objects but I want to do that without removing the mystery and the spiritual reality that we are called to be something different. But each and every one of us who've received the call of Jesus and accepted the offer to follow Him, and we have become His holy ones, His saints. I want us to think about what that means. And really where we need to begin is with the law of Moses. We need to go back to when Moses was teaching those people of Israel coming out of Egypt, what it meant to be holy. So I'm gonna very quickly run through a couple of passages from the Torah. Let's start in Exodus chapter 30. This passage that I wanna read, it, there's a whole section here that talks about various holy things. I just wanna focus in just to get some principles of holiness on the anointing oil. This is the oil that God calls Moses to make and then asks him to anoint various objects in the, in the tabernacle and the tabernacle itself, but also to anoint Aaron and his sons. And not only is the oil holy, in fact, it's called most holy, but it has the power to make holy whatever it touches. So let's look at that text together. This is, this is from Exodus chapter 30, verse 22. The Lord spoke to Moses, 
Take choice price, take choice spices, 12 and a half pounds of free flowing myrrh, half that, about six and a quarter pounds of sweet smelling cinnamon, six and a quarter pounds of sweet smelling cane, and 12 and a half pounds of cassia, all weighed according to the sanctuary shekel, and four quarts of olive oil. Now, we're making a lot, four quarts of anointing oil. You are to make this into a sacred anointing oil. Now, here's our word sacred. This word, um, it, it, it represents the, the word that is also going to be translated in this passage as holy. This is a, a word that has a special meaning, and I want us to read the passage to figure out what it is that it's saying makes this oil a sacred anointing oil, a perfumed compound, the work of a perfumer. It will be sacred anointing oil. With it, you are to anoint the tent of meaning, the ark of the testimony, the table and all its utensils, the lampstand and all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar for burnt offering and all its utensils, and the laver and its base. And so Moses takes this and he anoints all these, the tabernacle and all of these articles of worship that are inside the tabernacle. He goes on. So you are to sanctify them. Again, sanctify is our word, matches this word sacred, it matches this word holy. You are to sanctify them and they will be most holy. Anything that touches them will be holy. Now, in the Hebrew there, when it says they will be most holy, it actually is that same word used twice, once singular, second plural. So this is like saying they will be holy of holies. They will be the holiest they can be. And what does it mean for them to be holy? He goes on. You are to anoint Aaron and his sons and sanctify them, make them holy, so they may minister as my priests. And you are to tell the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointing oil throughout your generations. It must not be applied to people's bodies. Now, obviously that doesn't mean Aaron and his sons. What that means is applied to people's bodies as would commonly oil would be applied as a moisturizer or a cleanser or a healing element. It's not to be applied to common people's bodies. It's to be applied to make Aaron and his sons holy. And you must not make it any like it with the same recipe. So you don't make, you don't make your own anointing oil. And you, maybe you vary the recipe just a little bit, but no, God says, no, don't, don't make anything like it with the same recipe. It is, to, it is holy and it must be holy to you. It must be holy to you. So what we have here is the idea that this oil has a special purpose and its purpose is to make Aaron and his sons holy. It's to make the tabernacle and the articles inside the tabernacle holy. It's not to be used as oil is commonly used by the people. It's a special oil. And this is the meaning of what it is to be holy. It's set aside from other common oils for a special purpose, and that is to make things holy to God, which means to make them set aside for a special purpose. Aaron and his sons are set aside for a special purpose of participating in the worship and leading the people in worship. They are not the same. The Levites, their descendants, are not the same as the common people. They have a special purpose. And these articles, sure, there are wash basins all throughout the camp of Israel, but there's a special wash basin in the tabernacle that is for the purpose of cleansing before sacrifices are offered. Sure, there are lampstands all through the camp of Israel, but these lampstands anointed with this anointing oil have been made special for use in the tabernacle. This idea of cleansing them from their commonality, of setting them aside as special, 
This idea is the idea of holiness. Now, there is an idea in which we, we understand that the people of God, God's chosen people, the descendants of Abraham, also are to be made holy. So let's flip over to Leviticus chapter 19. Now, we don't really have time, and it probably wouldn't be appropriate to read all of Leviticus 19. There's probably some of this that doesn't quite fit for um, a normal church service. But I want to go through this passage and look at several ideas about the people becoming holy unto Yahweh. They are holy for Yahweh's purpose in the world. The people of Israel become the holy ones, the sanctified ones, the saints, if you will, depending on your English translation. So in Leviticus chapter 19, let's start with just the first four verses and see what it is that, that Moses is telling the people they are becoming. The Lord spoke to Moses, Speak to the whole congregation of the Israelites and tell them, You must be holy because I am holy. I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now this is a passage that Peter repeats in his first letter. And he says, Peter says to us as believers in Jesus, followers of Jesus, Moses says to the people of Israel as followers of Yahweh and followers of Moses, he says, you're to be holy because your God is holy. And, and what he's saying by that is, your God is not like any of the other gods in the world. Your God has a different approach to life. Your God is less violent. Your God has purpose for you in reconciling the nations to himself. Your God is special among the gods, is more powerful than all the gods, is the creator God. All of these ideas come into you're to be holy for Yahweh, the Lord your God, is holy. Each of you must respect his mother and father and you must keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. This phrase is going to be repeated over and over. The people of Israel are holy because they are set apart to Yahweh, our Elohim, our God. We are set apart to serve this particular God. That's what makes us holy. It's not that we're spiritual superhumans. It's not that there's magical powers in us. It is that we have a purpose. And that is to be of service to Yahweh and to join him in his mission in the world. Do not turn to idols and you must not make for yourselves gods of cast metal. I am the Lord your God. Now, I, I'm calling this holy submission. We are submitting ourselves to the mission of God in the world and it makes us holy. We're choosing to follow a particular God. And it makes us holy. It makes us holy because our God is holy. Now, let's skip a few verses. Let's go down to verse 9 and read. When you gather in the harvest of your land, you must not completely harvest the corner of your field. And you must not gather up the gleanings of your harvest. You must not pick your vineyard bare. And you must not gather up the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You must leave them for the poor and for the foreigner, I am the Lord your God. Now, I'm calling this, it's holy service. You see, God says, because I am a different kind of God, I'm a God who cares about the poor among you. I am a God who cares about the foreign residents among you. I am a God who cares about all the nations, not just my own special nation, but because you are my own special nation, you will give holy service to those around you, the poor and those who are struggling. Skip down a few more verses. Verse 13. You must not oppress your neighbor or commit robbery against him. You must not withhold the wages of the hired laborer overnight until morning. You must not curse a deaf person or put a stumbling block in front of a blind person. Now, you and I may ask who in the world would do that, but trust me, <laughs> there are people in the world. You must fear your God. I am Yahweh. I am 
the Lord. And I'm calling this holy neighboring. We interact with our neighbors and our peers and our friends and our family members different ways. We respect the dignity of the people around us and we care for their needs and make sure that we aren't selfish in our dealings with them. This is holy service to our holy God. It is making sure this is what it means to be a saint. To be a saint is not to perform a miracle. To be a saint is to take care of your neighbor, to mow their yard when they're taken ill or recovering from surgery. This is what it means to be a saint. Let's skip down a few more verses. This uh, may sound a little strange to you. Um, these kinds of ideas may <laughs> grate on you. But if we skip down to verse 26, you must not eat anything with blood still in it. You must not practice either divination or soothsaying. You must not round off the corners of, your hair, of the hair on your head or ruin the corners of your beard. You must not slash your body for a dead person or incise a tattoo on yourself. I am the Lord. Now these are strange. These are, we, we don't really understand these commands, but we're not living in the culture Israel was living in. And so I'm calling this holy religion. God says you're going to worship me in ways that aren't like the peoples around you. You're not going to participate in magic rituals or markings of yourself that are supposed to control the Elohim, the spiritual beings that you're worshiping. No, you're worshiping Yahweh. And I don't command child sacrifice. I don't command the tattooing of yourselves or the cutting of yourselves. I don't command self-harm or harm of others. I'm a different kind of God. I am holy and unique. Amongst all the gods, you will be holy and unique because you follow me. This is what it means to be a saint. We are called to worship God in ways that bring blessing to those in our congregation and bring blessing to our neighbors. We're called to follow God in ways that make us a blessing to the nations according to the promise made to Abraham. Now, this is all about the people of Israel. These are commandments of Moses to the people of Israel. But what about us as Christians? What about us um, living in the 21st century? How do we respond to the call of God in our lives. Let's look at Romans, excuse me, not Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, right at the beginning, as Paul is writing to a Gentile church, a non-Jewish church, and reminds them that they too are called to be holy. This is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. Think about the circumstances of your call, brothers and sisters. Not many were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were born to a privileged position. But God chose what the world thinks foolish to shame the wise. And God chose what the world thinks weak to shame the strong. Far from the idea that we are to be spiritual superhumans. God says, I've chosen the weak, and the foolish, to demonstrate to the world the wisdom and the strength of God. I've chosen you to a special purpose, a special calling. Let's, let's read on. God chose what is low and despised in the world, what is regarded as nothing, to set aside what is regarded as something, so that no one can boast in his presence. He is the reason you have a relationship with Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. I want to focus in 
on what Jesus became to us that Paul talks about in this passage. He became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification. This is from the Greek word for holiness or saints or sanctification and redemption. God became for us wisdom because what the world calls wise, what the world would advise us to do, the way the world would teach us to behave is not in God's eyes wisdom. And God came, and Jesus came, to demonstrate for us what true wisdom really is. This wisdom that says love your neighbor as yourself, this wisdom that says love your enemies and pray for your enemies, this wisdom that calls us to turn the other cheek. This wisdom that begs us to care for the little children and the poor and the least among us. This wisdom that says the people of God can be the agents of change to bring the kingdom of God to earth so that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And we are His righteousness, His fair treatment, of the people in the world, the res restoration of dignity and, and justice for the people around us. It'll be through the church. It'll be through the holy ones, the called out holy ones of God, that the goodness of God comes into the world. And this is our sanctification. It is the job we've been set apart for. It, to be saints in the world, is to be what God called us to be. And we are the redemption, the buying back of the people of the world to their Creator and Father in heaven. It is the ministry of reconciliation that Paul will talk about later in this letter. It is that call to be part of God's mission, bringing back to Himself all of humanity. Now listen, I know the idea of saint language is foreign to most of our religious background and experience. In fact, many years ago, when we, Brenda and I first came to Oak Ridge, I began to call Beverly Brown Saint Beverly. And it always embarrassed her and she always said, oh Ron, you know, and, and kind of chided me for saying that. Those of you who know Bev Brown know that that is a perfect moniker for her especially when we understand what it means to be a saint. Does not mean to be some spiritual superhuman. Does not mean to be some magical religious figure who uh, changes the world by their own power. But rather, it simply means to be a human being surrendered, submitted to God and partnering with God in the ministry of bringing wisdom and justice and righteousness and redemption into the world. Bev Brown is Saint Beverly to me because she so exemplifies what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. And so are so many of you. You are Saint Azalee and you are Saint Josh Jones and you are Saint Zach Tipton and you are Saint Ian White and Saint Bonnie Jones. You are Saint Alyssa Harris and you are Saint Brenda Johns. Everyone knows because she's put up with me and not killed me yet. We are saints because we have joined God in God's work. We are saints because we are the weak and the foolish and the, and the unprivileged and the powerless who make a difference in this world because we let God make a difference in our own lives and that goodness spills out into the lives around us. This is what we are called to be, brothers and sisters. We are called to be saints. Now, it's not about us. It's not about our power or our privilege or our skill or our talent or our wisdom. Abigail is not Saint Abigail because she leads us in worship every week. She leads us in worship every week because she is Saint Abigail. She is chosen to serve the church using the talents God has given her. This is what it means to be a saint. 
So it's not about setting ourselves up for special honors or special privilege or special veneration. What it is about is demonstrating the goodness of God. And so Paul ends this section of Scripture by saying, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now here's what I want to challenge you to do this week. I want you to take just a few minutes to pray about it right now. And I want you to think of something. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you something that God has done in your life that you can brag on God about. I want you to think of something God has done in your life that you can say to another person, God did this for me. Maybe he did it recently. Maybe he did it sometime in the past. And if it's possible and you're willing to share it with a brother or sister right here today, then pick up your phone and text it. Call somebody when this video's over and tell them. If you want to just journal about it or make a note of it in your phone to yourself, this is what God did today or this is what God did for me. Maybe you want to write it on a post-it note and stick it to your bathroom window. But I want you to brag on God this week. And if you can't think of something right now, make a commitment to be thinking about and watching for it this week. And look for an opportunity to share with someone else, this is what God has done for me. Will you pray with me? Holy Father in heaven, we ask you to bless this time of Bible study. We've gone through a long set of scriptures to think about what it means to be holy, what it means to be set aside for special purpose, and what it means to make a difference with our lives in the world. We pray, Father, that you will make each and every one of us saints, that we will be your holy people called out of the world to go back into the world with the ministry of reconciliation and redemption. Help us, Father. Be your hands and feet. Be the love and mercy and grace of a holy trinity calling all humanity back into communion and fellowship with yourself. We pray it through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, with the intercession of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Father, hear our words. Amen. See you in a couple of weeks, Oak Ridge. So roll up your sleeves. Get your head in the game. Be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. Don't lazily slip back into those old grooves of evil, doing just what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then. You do now. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life a life energetic and blazing with holiness. God said, I am holy, you be holy.